George Macy Foundations. And that is just a mere coincidence that the first meeting was almost on the same day when uh, Churchill gave his famous Fulton speech, the concept of Iron Curtain, which influenced our life very strongly, was mentioned the first time. And the very last conference was in the March in 1953, the same month when Stalin died. And so, uh, you also have cybernetics, of, of course, was based on the concept of information theory, which was that time was syntactical information theory, and Neumann offered to Shannon to use the concept of entropy to measure information. And we have different types of concept of entropy that maybe Stefan will mention today. I don't know, maybe not. Yeah. <laughs> but, but he has a lot of knowledge about it. And something that cybernetics emphasized, and now maybe might have a role, that was the neurosis and the pathology of mental life. And slowly, slowly we are in a situation where we recognize that neurological and psychiatric disorders, uh, many of them are dynamic diseases, and there is, uh, there is an emerging new field called computational psychiatry, uh, which has a double meaning. First, how to use computational methods uh, in understanding psychiatric disorders and diseases, and the second is the psychiatric disease as an uh, impairment in the computational systems of the mind. I think that's more than enough. This is starting point. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, excuse me. Um, I think that uh, systems research and uh, cybernetics research have uh, some line or inner logic of development. So um, it, it, and it, it is interesting. Uh, always to follow the, uh, so to say, adventures of ideas in systems research and in cybernetics. And um, in, in my opinion, in my um, summarizing my experience in uh, thinking uh, and in, research, in studying of uh, systems and complex systems, I would say that um, a systems um, perspective, which is in the middle from uh, cybernetics, and I, uh, have, um, I view some roots of cybernetics even in physiology, in medicine, in uh, the um, views of um, physicians, uh, for example, Claude Bernard in uh, 19th century, and then cybernetics, and then systems research, and then complexity, and theory of complexity, and theory of um, complex adaptive systems. So, um, for me, uh, as I see all this line of development, past, uh, present, and I think that the, the, uh, the challenging um, points of, of future, for, for the future and still uh, problems which we have in uh, systems research uh, may be connected with uh, um, the, emergent, uh, the emergencies or phase transition, the most difficult um, <coughs> transition from uh, non-living matter to, to living matter. First, then from living matter to human being, and then from uh, living being to uh, human mind and human spirit. So, for me, uh, as, I, as I view this line, so cybernetics was mostly um, dealing with the uh, process of homeostasis. From, um, with the, the processes of uh, how to maintain the equilibrium. Now we, uh, um, we want also to view not only uh, homeostasis, but also the fast development. Fast development. Why? Because the world is very unstable. Unstable. It's full of crises. And to, to um, understand the inner mechanism of this fast development.
development of phase transition, of bifurcation, of cascade of bifurcation is very important. And um, concerning these uh, emergencies in the, in the big history of nature and mankind, I would um, uh, like to, uh, 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 to make focus on uh, um, such uh, two uh, points. Why uh, one it is, uh, and for, for me it's uh, a surprise, uh, I always wondering why the, so, uh, the modern, um, for example, um, <coughs> cognitive science and um, epistemology uh, does not uh, deal with uh, the higher level of human mind with a uh, human spirit, uh, with a uh, geist, so, Zagreb did not show, with geist, the concept of spirit is lacking in the modern, in, in the modern uh, field of research, in the uh, modern books, in the huge literature about it. Why? It's very interesting. Well, if we, this instructor, will not think about uh, the, the uh, higher level of human spirit, the, uh, another spirit, spiritual local uh, people from, uh, uh, um, from church will do it. And it, it is another, it's our, it's our field. Our view. And another uh, point, and I will finish already because I, um, it's, uh, it's uh, to, to make bridges, I, I think it's very interesting, uh, between uh, life sciences and cognitive sciences. Life sciences and cognitive sciences, and to develop a uh, uh, very wide uh, systems. Uh, uh, and evolutionary perspective of, of, um, and uh, um, from this standpoint uh, try to, uh, to try to combine ethics, human ethics, human freedom and also uh, ethical issues, uh, responsibility, aesthetics, the feeling of beauty and the processes of uh, Cognitive processes, the uh, searching of truth. So this is a philosophical task, and we can do it now using uh, our developed notions of systems thinking. I consider it as a, as a big challenge for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Um, thank you for the invitation. Uh, my name is Stefan Turner. I have uh, three jobs. One is um, that I'm heading a complex systems research institute at the Medical University. I am a part time researcher at the ASA, which is outside of the United States, I'm faculty of the Santa Fe Institute. Um, I am sorry that I cannot really say something about the progress of. Uh, cybernetics and systems research, since I'm not really part of the community, but I feel that uh, I can say a little bit about the progress of complex system science um, in the past years. So, what, what is the difference between these two fields? I really don't know much, but I have a little bit the feeling that the themes are very similar that are discussed, but um, into cybernetics went all the social science, the scientists, and into complex systems, the physicists went. This could be maybe a, a, this is a little bit, in my view, uh, how, the, how, the, how our community is different. Um, about complex systems science, or the science of complex adaptive systems, um, this is more than 25 years old. A few top physicists uh, and economists decided to tackle problems which were not approachable by any 
uh, scientific method before. Basically, these type of problems were problems of dynamical systems with ever-changing boundary conditions. So, if you think of the, if you think of traditional science, science is something where you fix your boundary conditions, you cut something out of the universe, and then you can describe it with a set of differential equations, for example. If you do not fix your boundary conditions, you can never solve your differential equations. You can therefore not make predictions. You cannot test it experimentally. You lose science, as we were taught of doing uh, how to do science by Newton 300 years ago. Um, in complex systems, you have the problem that you have a dynamical system, and this system um, you cannot cut out from the universe and study by itself, but it has boundary conditions and it influences and changes these boundary conditions as part of a dynamical process. If you think of this, what this means mathematically, this is a set of differential equations where your boundary conditions are part of the coupled system and this is a mathematical monster, you cannot treat it. And this is the type of problems that about 25 years ago, this set of people, some of them from Santa Fe, started talking about. The game changer, why, could, why, why, why is it now possible to address these problems, is of course the use of the computer, the use of uh, HE based models, and a completely new type of statistics. Um, the progress that has come out of this field is, I think, pretty remarkable. We are in these years now um, in the position that we are constantly advising decision makers in the United States, in the OECD, in the Fed, in the United States, in the European Central Bank. The European Union, as you have maybe seen last year, has spent about 50 million euros in calls that are related to complex systems science. As, um, um, uh, yeah. Another project around the corner where the EU maybe will um, set up a billion euros for the next couple of years, completely dedicated to uh, quantitative science and complex systems. Maybe you have heard about the European flagship projects, um, which are uh, which will be decided on very shortly. Future ICT is the name of this complex systems uh, uh, flagship that's waiting to be approved. Complex system scientists um, are thinking about how to reform our financial markets. They are designing search engines for the internet. They design your traffic systems. Think of the billions which are spent in systems biology, which is a little brother, or a big brother, even of complex system science. And um, these are some of the uh, results. The triumphs of complex system science, in my personal view, is network theory. And network theory in combination with statistical mechanics and the set of applications that come out of it. Namely, the problems could make a real progress in understanding evolutionary dynamics. And um, also the combination of network theory and statistic, statistical mechanics um, leads to a deeper understanding of what non-equilibrium economics is. And um, we are at the edge of representing whole societies as so-called multiplexes. I don't know if you know what the multiplex is. This is a set of networks which connect the same set of people. That's basically what a society is. It's a collection of social networks between the same people where these uh, networks mutually influence the other networks. <coughs> Highly complicated uh, mathematical problem. We are at the, at the frontier of um, understanding societies as such dynamical multiplexes. The reason for these successes, I think, is solely due to a, sing a single fact, namely that the science of uh, 
complex adaptive systems is a predictive and quantitative science. So the representatives of these sites, they uh, have undertaken the boring, boring job of using data that's now being collected at, uh, at tremendous rates and to use this data to test and reject their models. This is, I think, the, the, the reason for success. That so many models that have been produced in complex system sciences in science get rejected. That's the big progress. Um, because the, the few ones that survive testing, uh, they have the potential of being of predictable use, of predictive use. I think that um, complex system science is changing society. It's co-evolving with the revolutionary changes that are all around us. Complex system science is somehow a catalyst for societal change. So if you think of internet and uh, if you think of example that your cell phone knows more about you than your mother does, um, these things have to learn about you, right? And this, it, it is not a neural network that is um, learning these things about you and your neighborhood and surroundings. It's a combination of things. It's a combination of network theory, understanding of uh, uh, social networks. It's a new type of statistic, statistics that has to be combined with this. And um, um, and um, yes, and technology and search engines, page rank things, and its descendants. Um, so in this core evolution, we're speeding up with our contributions to revolutionary changes in society and we're creating also demands for data <coughs> and um, let me stop with an outlook we can ask if this is very if this is really cool um, what is happening so one thing that's happening is that we're collecting data about societies more and more and I'm sure you know you all know about what happened on April 1st this year, two weeks ago, one week ago. Um, it's not a joke. Um, all the information about your location, about your emails, about uh, what you click on the internet, what you read, what you exchange with friends, all your telephone talks are recorded. They're not used for anything up to now, but it's just a matter of time that this uh, data will be publicly available, either because it gets stolen or because the commission will ask us scientists to make uh, sense out of this data. And um, this, of course, has implications on our concept of civil rights. And um, I think this would need more debate, uh, a large-scale debate, if we really want this. Of course, we want the progress of complex system science to understand more about our species, but at the same time, we should, in my opinion, not uh, go in the direction of reduction of reduction of civil rights. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Peter. Well, my name is Peter Scherer. I'm coming from Budapest, Hungary. And, uh, First, I would like to give some comments or actually reflections for the question that why do I think that systems level approach is important. I think there are at least three reasons, obviously there are many more and the discussion may, may uncover some, some many more. But uh, first of all, there are data now available, as uh, Stefan uh, already mentioned about uh, his uh, uh, recall from the society type of data, but also in biology and in many systems. Uh, which are system level data and, uh, and therefore give us the chance at least uh, to, to, to work with them uh, and, and to try to understand them as a, as a whole. Now the second has been also mentioned already, just I would like to put this together uh, as it has been put together, put together in my mind, that uh, the 21st century will be most probably a century of crisis situations which are coming in one after the other because uh, the, the tsunami, the environment of Western civilization 
has been changed a lot, uh, meaning that uh, they, they reach the limits of, uh, of growth in the sense of, of, of Earth or capacities of the Earth. Uh, we have an overpopulation, which we haven't had to this extent uh, previously, and so on and so on. So this situation has changed, and therefore the, the, the behavior has to be changed. But obviously the behavior is not changing smoothly most of the time, but the behavior has to be changed through a crisis situation series, uh, which needs to be prediction, predictions, and this needs to be a systems level approach. Uh, last but not least, I would like to pose it uh, in a way that we are recovering from an extremes of reductionism uh, in science. Uh, as in yesterday at Symposium, all Peter Erdi posed it uh, very nicely for me, that we are recovering in biology from the tyranny, as he told, of molecular biology. Since I was a molecular biologist five years ago, I am now in the position of a, a, a dictator who was overthrown, or a representative of a dictator who was overthrown, and I'm very happy to be overthrown because I understood that uh, once you have this extreme reductionist approach, like having one protein isolated, as in my case it was, having another protein isolated, and then see how these two single proteins are interacting to each other, this is nonsense, because in, in the real cell there are hundreds and thousands of other proteins which are interacting with both and, and influencing this single interaction. So your data which you which you recovered after a lot of suffer, uh, are nonsense, uh, uh, practically. Uh, so uh, I'm not saying these data are useless, because these are the data we are using at the moment, but by themselves, re reducing the world to this single thing, and not understanding that the world, the world is more complex, uh, that is an extreme which, which, we, should, which we should all avoid. Uh, however, there might be another extreme, and I would like to warn ourselves not to go to the extremes of system balancing and forget about the data themselves and forget about the details themselves. So I think a, a fine kind of balance uh, is useful, and I would like just to close my, my, my little kind of remark by three kind of methodological comments, which probably relate to this. The first of them, that I would like to warn ourselves that we should be humble, in the sense that to understand that a complex system is, it does have limits. Uh, I just would like to give you the story of a protein, which is in our brain, or which is in the brain of a person. Uh, this protein enjoys the company of other proteins, and, and enjoys the, the dynamics of other proteins. The, the other proteins, the neighboring proteins, are kicking this protein because of this dynamics. There are uh, information exchanges going on in that nebula cell in the brain. Now let's suppose, or let's think about, that this person who is the owner is, is a young boy or young girl, uh, or she uh, or he is just in, before the very first date of her or his life. She or he is very excited, obviously. Therefore, the nebular cells are very excited, and therefore the proteins are kicking the neighboring proteins physically at an extreme level. Now, that poor protein in the middle of this turmoil doesn't have a clue. Why is this turmoil is going out or around me? I mean, why the others are kicking so violently me at this very time? He, that protein has no idea that the is brain. Uh, has no idea that the brain has an owner, and the owner is just before the first date of his or her life. And that's the major reason why, why this whole turmoil is on. So, I think if we just believe or think about the moment that we are the proteins in a brain which has an owner, which has a company or a, or a lover, and, and about the first, first date situation, then we start to understand that how humble we should be when we try to understand these systems at a higher level. So this was the first remark. The second remark that we have to be very cautious. Now, one reason why we have to be very cautious, because it is a very much, it has a very big difference that we try to find solutions to problems, or we try to find problems to solutions. And at systems level thinking, often we have nice models, and Stefan already told that it is a major thing that some of these models were dis, dis, uh, dis, uh, uh, disproved uh, because they were not very useful models. But sometimes we are sticking to our models very much, and we try to find a segment of the world which is finally, finally, luckily, uh, can be described by that model. 
I would like to warn ourselves to the dangers of this type of thinking because it is not dangerous by itself, but if it goes to the extremes and they figure out the world as such, uh, 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 having some data which are probably not even existing uh, to justify a model, that is dangerous. Now, very last remark, uh, that's actually a, a kind of uh, a personal thing, why do I love to be at this conference? that we have to be open-minded, and I think in this conference there are people who are very much open-minded and, and that's, that's a major advantage of this meeting. Uh, I just would like to give you an example of, of the importance of being open-minded. Last summer there was the Network Scientist Conference in Budapest, that is the major conference for network people at the moment, and I was uh, happy to chair a, a session where there was a lecture about uh, uh, actually a phase transition type of event in networks. It is called the Achillotas process, if someone is, uh, is familiar with this in, in the network field. And there was a woman who was making an account on this, on this phase transition type of thing. And uh, at the end of the lecture, uh, she, she was a physicist. Uh, at the end of the lecture, she was interrupted by, the, by a mathematician from the audience that all what you have said about this phase transition is stupid, it's nonsense. Because if you extrapolate this network to the, to the infinite, so there, there, are, there is infinite number of nodes in this network, then this uh, phase transition becomes not to be a phase transition, so in the strict definition sense, it is nonsense, because it is not a phase transition. Then the woman answered that, but come on, I mean, it is nowhere happening that there is such a big network which has infinite number of nodes. And if we have proved if the network is having an infinite number minus one nodes, then this is a phase transition. So in all real cases it is a phase transition, but obviously in the clear case of mathematics it is not. But then the woman continued that I just would like to recall a paper from Nature which was written by biologists when they were telling about critical transitions and I would like to scold them because critical transitions are really not phase transitions not from even this point of view and those are messy and, and this phase transition is a real one not from a mathematical point of view but at least from the physics point of view so I think this way of thinking about this phase transition as an example tells us that how open-minded we should be because in this particular case biologists, physicists and mathematicians are having a completely <coughs> different concept of, of, of this kind of sudden transitions, what you may call critical transition or phase transition if you are uh, less or more strict. And I think also all of them are right and, and, and we should, should be aware of it. Good morning, I'm Alexander Laszlo, the last uh, in the chain of proteins of the Aryans. Um, on the panel, um, and I would like to uh, do a little bit in terms of both the retrospective and the current assessment and the prospective, just briefly, since this is a very rich uh, presentation since the very beginning, and I'm looking forward to then some conversations around them. Hopefully, I can also throw in a few things that might be a little bit more controversial and have some conversations. This approach of systems and the cybernetics as a general approach to be able to understand complex, the complexity, complexity of the world in which we live, to be able to have a way to reduce the input that we receive all the time sensorially and process it in terms that can make sense of it, that we can have actionable frames of engagement with our realities. Not reducing things to structures, very much in the classical forms of science, but now reducing them more to uh, questions of processes and dynamics. We often trace this back to von Bertalanffy, and uh, that is a very uh, good place to begin to look at uh, these approaches here in the Western world, but it goes actually back much, much further. Of course, we can think of this in the um, in, in non-Western frames, uh, in terms of engagements with holistic, holistic engagements with reality, holistic engagements with our cosmology. And even back in our Western friends, the tales of Miletus, and then since then to Nicholas de Causa, Alfred North Whitehead, 
There have been a plenty of precursors, including um, Alexander Bogdanov, who at very much a similar time uh, of Umberto who came forward with these approaches that transcend the siloed views of nature and of phenomena. And this, I think, is the particular contribution of systems and cybernetics to be able to allow us <coughs> to see across disciplines, to see across perspectives, this quest for isomorphisms. And now we're looking not just at isomorphisms across disciplines, but we're looking at it in the contemporary frame in terms of experiences as well. So this push that has come then, if we trace at least in the Western tradition back to Thales of Juventus and forward, then uh, in 1954 with von Bertrand Fee and, uh, and, and Kenneth Balding and uh, Anatole Rappaport, and we have also uh, George Miller and Ralph Gerard and Paul Weiss, and these are many of the seminal thinkers in the, the area that have looked towards a framing for the unity of science so we can move beyond these arguments between the mathematicians and the biologists and then the chemists and the physicists. And that's just within the sciences, but also to then transcend and address some of the questions and concerns that, for example, C.P. Snow put forward in these famous lectures about the two cultures between the sciences and the humanities. And I think this is where we are now uh, coming to much more. We are still very much working with the systems and cybernetic sciences. And the challenge that I feel we are facing now is to think in terms of sciences that embrace also the human sciences. So looking at social sciences, psychological sciences, um, looking at emergent phenomena that bring in to play multiple intelligences. And here we have uh, moved in the direction of thinking in terms uh, also of uh, emotional intelligence. There have been frames of ecological intelligence. There have been frames of trying to expand and create dimensions of appreciation, of thinking, of cognition that explore spiritual intelligence. Now these are all areas of cognition and areas of perception um, that have been explored quite recently. But I would suggest that they are still siloed and that what the systems and cybernetics approaches can offer is a systemic intelligence, a holistic intelligence. The risk here also is to take it to extreme, not to take it to extremes, because we can move from a form of reduction to the parts and move away from that to what Edgar Morin has pointed out as a risk in holism that takes us to a reduction to the whole, where we appreciate things only at the level of holistic phenomenon and do not appreciate the fine aspects of their subsystems. In, in other words, looking at the, the uh, analytical and the um, uh, being able to dissect the system is also very important at the same time as understanding when it's appropriate not to dissect it when it's appropriate to understand it at the level of the whole, but not always and only restrain ourselves to an understanding at the level of the whole. Again, that would be a reduction to the whole. So seeing, and I think one of the, one of the real challenges of our time now is to move and in, in, in embrace these approaches that involve uh, uh, aesthetics and ethics, as was mentioned earlier, and to engage in a type of integral systems approach that brings into play more than Western appreciations, more than the classical scientific appreciations, that brings into play forms of intelligence, forms of appreciation that are part of our heritage as a, uh, as a species. Um, and engaging now in forms of metalogue, dialogues with self, dialogues with each other, dialogues with nature, expanding our ways of creating meaning together. How can we do this? And uh, this is one of the challenges that systems and cybernetics approaches uh, have to offer. And to explore the ways in which we can appreciate self as instruments in this process. And not just develop technologies upon which we rely to explore the world around us but finding ways of fine-tuning our own perceptual ability.
<coughs> this, I think, is one of the challenges that we have in, uh, uh, in, in terms of moving into a frame of being that one might think of as integral systemic or holistic being. And I would like to then just um, uh, conclude with some challenges, perhaps. We heard a little bit about the ways in which systems and cybernetic sciences tend to be predictive and quantitative. And I would invite us to explore ways in which we can uh, move towards more of forecasting natures rather than predictive natures. And beyond that, to the design <laughs> frameworks in terms of social systems design, in terms of evolutionary systems design, that involve backcasting approaches, so it involves idealizing the future state. Russell Lakoff worked very strongly on idealized system design, so did John Moorfield and Bill Abanathy and several others. And the approach then there is to be able to vision and vision, use our ability to dream, the powerful ability to dream, to imagine desirable states, protopias, not utopias, but realizable futures into which we may live ourselves. How do we bring ourselves to those states? Here, then, we come back to the processes of creating the prototype systems that will bring us forward into those, uh, into those states. But it involves a backcasting approach. And rather than seeking to predict futures, I would look for ways that we can curate the emergence of protopias. Curating the emergence of systems involves a much more of a humble approach. It involves listening, observing, seeing what is emerging. It involves being at the liminal state of consciousness as well, rather than purely at the rational frame. And being able then to uh, truly embrace the power of um, of what began at the times of the Tales of Miletus as an appreciation of complexity that was not divided into an either epistemological or ontological frames. And this is still a big debate in the systems community as is the systems approach ontological or is it epistemological? But prior to that division, it was seen to be nuseological, gnosis coming from the notion of gnosis, and appreciating the ways in which we construct our realities based on a, uh, a, a formulation of our conceptual patterns that relate directly to and have direct relation correlation with our life experiences. How can we bring back this framing, this museological framing, rather than falling into the further divisive patterns again of epistemology and ontology? Um, so finally then, I would like to just to point to some very interesting directions that are emerging along these lines. <clears throat> the quest for creating these protopias has to be embodied in organizations that can walk this talk. Organizations that live according to a holarchic process of engagement and that begin to engage in uh, an emergent processes that aren't predictive, exclusively predictive in nature, because again, so once you can predict the system, that is to emerge is no longer emergent. For it to be truly emergent, there is this element of awe, of sacredness, and of awareness of that which is emerging. For us to be engaged in these dynamics, in a process that births new realities, we have to take on a triple role. And I think the sciences of complexity can help with this. This triple role involves us being both midwives to protopias that can emerge. At the same time as we midwife in the sense of curating the emergence of the possible, we must also be the mothers, we must also give birth, we must also be the ones who produce two new organizational forms, two new relational awareness, these new, uh, new dynamics, new social systems. So we have to be midwives, we have to give birth, and we also have to be that which is being born. We ourselves have to be the new systems, the new social systems. And um, there is one very interesting organization that is just coming into, uh, into being that approaches this in ways that seek to bring it to the educational frames. 
the Giordano Bruno Global Shift University is <coughs> just coming up and offers uh, a way of exploring this past, present, and this eliciting, this emergence process through an educational framework that brings people into a storytelling engagement, not telling us stories, which are the typical educational frameworks, not even simulating stories where we get to work with models and experience the simulations of realities, but actually bringing us into narrative engagements with our own living world and exploring how we can further those narratives into these protopias, into a true global eco-civilization. I think this is the major challenge for systems and cybernetics in this century. Thank you very much to all the panelists. Uh, we have now uh, half an hour for, for an open discussion. Uh, I would just like to ask people to take more than three minutes to have a, a fluid discussion. Uh, after three minutes, I will take the microphone from you. <laughs> we would like to start with a question or comment for um, the general public or, or, for, the, or for the panelists. Uh, 
uh, integral systemic thrivability involves uh, our engagement with the more than living world. Uh, sorry, the more than human world. With the more than human world. And many of our social systems design, many of our systems approaches are exclusively concerned with the human world. It's very anthropocentric, very in Carol Merchant's terms, it's very homocentric. How then do we begin to see ourselves as part of a living web of life? Of course, uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, Paul Weiss and, and, uh, and Miller also have looked very much at this uh, approach, and so has the bridge of copper and so on, in of the web of life. And then we have to bring in the framework that is trans temporal. And so now we move from interpersonal, interpersonal, trans species, and trans generational or trans temporal. And in that frame now, we start to see ourselves as part of a narrative that respects the traditions of our ancestors. And of all species, and only just our own. But also then brings this into the future and brings into our deliberation process the future generations, or the voices as well of those who are not yet present but who are stakeholders in whatever decisions we make. And there's much that we have to learn from wisdom cultures around the world because they often have these built in. They have these types of, have the empty share for future generations, the seven generation rule, the Uruguayans, and so on. So again, being able to create these protopias are things that we know how to do. But if we function only on the basis of our dreams, only on the basis of the ideals, then I think uh, we, will, uh, uh, we will fall short. Uh, okay, thank you very much for some stimulating ideas, some of which I found rewarding, and others which I would, if conversation allowed, challenge. I'd like to um, suggest that a key aspect of being systemic is to be able to move to different levels of abstraction. So my invitation is to move to another level of abstraction and to reflect on what we have done when we have done what we did as scientists doing systems and cybernetics over the last 50 years and to think about that in ethnographic terms. I think that would be a revealing inquiry. Uh, and my uh, second reflection then would be to think about um, what we need to do if we accept the explanation that humans are changing uh, the climate of the world, uh, which brings us into a new period in human history, and which I would suggest throws up for consideration not only uh, ideas, but all of the institutional arrangements we have built in the past amongst which I would include the doing of science. And what I found a common thread between all speakers was a desire to conserve a particular notion of doing science. And I wonder if there's a reflection uh, to be offered by panel members on the doing of science in the future. Thank you. Uh, Anyone any would like to comment on the reflection? Or, or we can gather several comments and then uh, go back to the panel, perhaps. Thank you very much, uh, for your wonderful uh, talk and uh, <coughs> journey out. And especially what I like there, a sort of a mystery which is still somewhere there, which uh, makes us humans and not really robots, because uh, from the technical and applied mathematical point of view, uh, I was struggling for a long time. How it's happened that practically all the uh, examples we have of study we then uh, can uh, make uh, working with our applied mathematical tool. And it was really a horrible question you know, to pose to ourselves, to myself, like, are there uh, robots around and me, myself as well. And then to uh, come back to the mystery, I think that uh, this uh, very uh, productive uh, uh, tools we can find uh, in a kind of art, artistic representations which we are always surrounded uh, around uh, and which we are using in our metaphors, in our situations and in our languages quite a lot. Also, uh, I want to point here that I think that the mathematics itself is the same kind of artistic language and don't forget about that because actually this is the most purest, the purest, the most, uh, let's say, constructive but in any way that's the same kind of artistic language and it depends on our ability to work with it what kind of axioms we put there and how we'll um, be flexible with that uh, to bring it uh, to find out the answers. So to my mind, I think that we uh, and cybernetics and uh, uh, systems research is exactly in the position
decision now to fight how, how this non-formal and uh, formal, uh, let's say, links and uh, uh, cooperation can be done in the best way. Thank you. I'd like to come back to the topic of ethics and think a bit uh, further. I think it's very important to consider the limits of our theories. That is the application. That is, if you talk about ethics, it's, uh, it's the point of responsibility for applying your theories. And this has got to do with education. Is if you have to teach our students, we have what, what I think in many cases we do, we just teach them explanations. And we don't teach them the uh, simplifications, the class categorizations, classifications go into and what's behind it. So we don't teach them really the limits of the applications. Uh, that's due to the way we teach in, uh, in, in some sense in science. Also. And so I'd like to make it short and come back to two to, to three sort of postulates, which I think are at the bottom of this. And if we understand them, we understand <coughs> Both in an ontological and in the logical way, things, and then we can re reflectively correct. That's the point I'd like to make. Okay, the first postulate is first of all, our, our, our concepts naturally it must be fuzzy because we have to simplify things in order to be able to make predictions about the uh, parameter values. We, we mustn't use the parameter values just to steer reality and then to identify the parameter values we have. Second point is, theories are uh, maps, uh, theories, and models are incomplete. Of course, I don't need to get into that. It should be known to all of us. Third, which is the thing which I think is most important, is that in many cases we just project our theories or our understanding. Projecting, I mean, we take them much too literally, and therefore action guiding descriptive in this sense. And if we look at these three elements, we come back to ethics, we come back to different ways of teaching, and then perhaps we see that we have to discuss more dialogue, more thinking, be more careful about the implication of, of whatever we, we think is a scientific result. Okay. Let's have one more comment before returning to the panel. So, I, I feel a lot of science and I would like to comment a little bit the basic questions from this point of view. Uh, if we consider from this point of view of the past, and present and the future of these disciplines, I think we should have to apply the concept of analogy. Analogy, analogy. Uh, which, uh, because I think uh, uh, actually, if we consider the concept of systems or concept of cybernetics, uh, this means that uh, in these cases we apply a kind of uh, um, analogy between a different kind of beings in the world. In a certain sense, this is a very crucial um, point in this case, I think. And the question from this point of view is that. Uh, can we accept or can we see the same similarities in the recent time and the future? Can we see the same similarities between the events or between the things, between the conditions at, as it was in the 30s or the 40s, 50s? Or we, can, we should have to find some different analogies now. So, uh, for example, it's very clear that in the 30s, the totality, the problems of totality uh, uh, was a really important problem, of course. And it, it was also, it's very clear again that in the uh, 40s, 50s, the governance or, or the control of these things was also a very important problem, not only in the natural sciences, but everywhere, but you can see. It. Uh, but the question is, how, uh, about the, how can we find, what kind, how can we find the Recent common uh, characteristics of the event now. So, so, so how, how do you think about this? I suppose that uh, this, it, all of these events are a kind of cultural environment or the 
about the culture much more than, than the uh, simple scientific or simple, I don't know, uh, business. Okay, thanks. Would there be any of the colleagues who would like to comment? Yeah, so, five years to this camp who believes that society is too serious to leave it for the social scientists and everywhere for the politicians. So there is an emerging field computational social science which, which might be interpreted as a successor of cybernetics and complex system research and we should take it really seriously. So those of us who come, so still we live in these two worlds, but those of us who came from this hard science still we would like to know what we are talking about. We, use, we try to use concepts which have some definition and of course we know uh, that some systems can be predicted, some of not. So we should know what are the limits of predictability to ex maybe widening the limits of predictability to accept that there are systems which are inherently unpredictable and we live with it. That's all. I just wanted to mention the ways in which our framing of things in terms of problems that we take from the sciences often. When we bring that into uh, these fuzzy aspects the, uh, of, of uh, social systems design, we can come into some ethical dilemmas. To think of people as problems to be solved, it's not so healthy, and yet we do that all the time. To think about life as a problem to be solved. But everything that we do in many times what we do in our approaches, our approaches that we try to think of as scientific, we look at it in terms of problems in need of solutions. But when we look at the process in a more organic, emergent frame and see what is, let's say, a, uh, the, um, the way in which what is coming now from aspects of biomimicry, for example, how does nature create conditions that are conducive to life? The idea again that Jeanine Binius puts forward that life creates conditions conducive to life. Well, there is a sense ability here. There is a ability to uh, appreciate, in perhaps in Sir Jacques Vickers' sense, the appreciative systems that we can be. What is the system, what are the systems, what is the nature of the systems that are emerging? I think then it is part of our engagement as uh, systems and thinkers and, and practitioners to then say, well, then how can we influence the system to perhaps create more, uh, create dynamics that are more life affirming, future oriented, and opportunity increasing? Will we know, can we predict that the ways in which we nudge the system, maybe setting up certain attractors? Uh, maybe minimizing other uh, in, uh, inputs and influences. Will we know what kind of out outcomes are going to be generated and what secondary and tertiary implications are? Well, we can start to model that and get some good ideas, but I don't think it's a question of us ever knowing for sure. But it's dancing with the process of change and learning how to continually model and remodel rather than to have a fixed model that we seek to apply. But this continuous redesign process, rather than thinking of problems to be solved, but engaging in this dance, I think that is very much part of the emerging approach, uh, the, uh, the scientific approach. And, and I think the power of analogy and metaphor, and not to be confused with homology, where we start to see things specifically with the structures are the same, identical, and from one to the next, but really looking analogically and, um, and metaphorically, that brings forward the whole art the aesthetics and the spirit then of our true creative potential. Thank you, Alexander. Uh, just want, uh, I would just like to, to summarize uh, several of the comments that have been made.
mentioned already. Uh, I think that's one of the big challenges of cybernetics and systems research and complexity lies in the fact that uh, we are quite an ambitious field. I mean, we're trying to solve uh, big problems in science uh, and in society and in technology. So, I mean, related to what Peter was saying, that we have to be humble. It's also a bit of contradiction because indeed we, we, we must be humble, but at the level at which we're aiming, we're also being uh, quite ambitious. And I, I think uh, another challenge of cybernetics for, for the future is, uh, we could say, it's mem memetic propagation. Because even when uh, the methods and theories that have been developed within cybernetics have propagated into uh, whole sciences, I mean, everybody speaks of systems. I mean, it's a natural thing nowadays, everybody speaks of systems, only that, let's say, they don't refer to it uh, directly to from that lab. Uh, and I think a similar thing has happened with cybernetics in the sense that uh, many of the approaches that people now call complexity, they're called cybernetics only that people don't call them cybernetics, and the same is happening with uh, complexity. Uh, many people in different disciplines are using methods and techniques for complexity. They just don't call it that way. Uh, so, in terms of the memetic propagation of the field, I think uh, one of the issues to, to be perhaps concerned or perhaps not that much because it's just a matter of terminology. I mean, the, the ideas that have been generated in cybernetics and systems research have been spreading and they are producing uh, in lots of them advancements in science. But the field itself, with the name, uh, it seems to be uh, not propagating as fast as it might. Uh, and one can uh, see a reflection of this in the number of, of PhD students that are attending this conference compared to, to uh, several other conferences. Uh, so we should also consider what, whether we want to, to uh, involve more students or whether we just want to give up the name cybernetics and use another term because it's just a, term of, uh, a matter of, of terminology. Uh, yes, there's a <coughs> question. It is so important that uh, certainly we are interested in finding out what is system and cybernetics, but very often we forget that systems and cybernetics are something that human beings have been using a lot of time before Bertan established some ideas about systems and before people also apparently discovered the cybernetics. But the main question that I think we should be dealing with system of cybernetics is to realize what is the situation of the world today and how the, what are the causality of that. First of all, I think and this picture of Rodan is quite illustrative because he mentioned we do not know what we are, we do not know where we come from, we do not know where we are going. And that is the big problem we are facing. But some immediate problems that we are not realizing the meaning of the system of cybernetics. Very often, only we are interested in this case is what to do with the new economic liberalism. We are doing nothing as system and cyberneticians with what we are doing about the warfare that started many millennia ago and continue and is increasing the danger of the great destruction of the, uh, of the planet and the annihilation of human beings. What are we doing about the dehumanization of human minds? Because most people is humanized it, and it is not recent. It, they started to be humanized as soon as some clever of our ancestor started to invent this slider, this slider, and this slider continue. You can see what the, the factories and the peasantry, it is quite illustrative what are doing the communist Chinese with the uh, workers. They are more the slave. That's uh, uh, many other people 
before. What are we doing with animals? We are abu abusing, we are exploiting all the animals. I am personally a vegetarian, not because of health, because I consider that all animals have the right to live with dignity. What are we, we doing about our situation? Because human beings are the predatory species. You can see what it has been uh, uh,
And uh, as I see, uh, the, the problem uh, can be, um, uh, the world can be changed when each of us will change. So, Hegel already said that the, uh, the world will change within a human, one man will change. So, the, the future and the world depends on us and it will go only through uh, some uh, slow tra transition through generation, through new education, because it, uh, this new thinking uh, should be in already in uh, mentality of the humankind, not be imposed in, in some um, such a force on the people. Already in mentality, already in the, it, it should be already in the air, in the air. Uh, and so um, the new education is needed also, a new education, because um, systems thinking and um, somebody will say, your systems approach is already a reduction in this. It's already a reduction to the systems. You are a reduction. So we have, we have to combine this, uh, maybe reduction also needed somebody. Reduction, reductionism is a good path to the Nobel Prize, to reduce some quarks, to reduce some, to, to elementary particles, to reduce uh, uh, biological organisms, living creatures, to, to physics, to physics, to the, uh, 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 some basic laws of nature. Why not? Why not? So we, we need a combination, a combination of holistic and reductionistic. We need a combination of uh, this phenomenological and theoretical and formal position. In order to solve this uh, global problems, we need a co-evolution. Uh, we need an uh, active position of each of us and uh, a way of conversation with nature. So, uh, I would say uh, unity in the, uh, in the way of the Russian cosmism, the unity of truth, uh, uh, good and beauty. I, and I, I would say uh, active position to elaborate this systems thinking and the new education um, and in, uh, as Alexander I like it, in transgeneration way. Not now, not here and now, but maybe in transgeneration way. Through the uh, human genes, through the human blood of each of us, of our children, our grandchildren. Is there any final comment from the panelist? Yes. There were um, three or four reflections on um, how science should be done. Just a um, um, personal comment on this. I think we don't have much choice. Science is a brutal evolutionary process and um, that works in a very simple way or has worked in a very simple way in the last 300 years. The best ideas win. The best ideas are those ideas that change society, that change society, or uh, the, the surviving uh, science is the new starting point, it's the new science. Very simple. If we like, uh, if this process throws away all sorts of beautiful other scientific ideas or other ways, I think it's just irrelevant. Another thing, another comment on doing system science by analogy, importance of metaphors. Um, I think this is a very nice way to get a feeling for a system. But it will never help you. There is no way around. If you want to understand the system, you have to understand the system. And um, it's a very trivial comment. But um, I think to understand the system, what you have to do always, and what you had to do always the last 300 years, 
is to ask very humbly, very um, quietly, the system. You have to ask good, good questions to your system, to nature, or nowadays society. And then you have to listen very carefully what nature replies. And if you are sensitive enough, you can make, you can put your flag on a discovery or something. I think, um, even though I like very much the idea of doing a new science or uh, doing it in a different way, I think much of what you have said, being humble and uh, listening, this is already there and this is a very successful uh, program has been. Thank you. Is there something very short?